to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In the book of 1 Samuel, the people learn the hard way. You better be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. Here they ask for a king so that they can be like all the nations around them. And God says in Hosea 13, 11, I gave them a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. It is what they wanted, but it wasn't at all what they needed. In fact, they already had a king but they would not submit to God and thus they wanted to be like everybody else. The ideas behind 1 Samuel teach us that God is still in control and as we study the living messages of 1 Samuel, we want to notice some key ideas. The first is the key verse. 1 Samuel 8 and verse 5, the elders of Israel come to Samuel and they say, look, you're old, your sons do not walk in your ways. Give us a king to judge us that we may be like all the nations around us. And of course, Samuel is offended by that. And he prays to God and God says, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Heed the voice of the people in all that they say. God was still in control and it was really a rejection of God. Friends, as we think about initially practical lessons to learn, we need to be sure that God is alive and well. His Son, Jesus Christ, is on the throne and there is authority that we must follow and that is the law of Christ. Key phrase is found in 1 Samuel 15, 22 where Saul approaches Samuel, or Samuel approaches Saul and says to him in his rebellion, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Look at the words of 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 22. Samuel is told, or Saul is told, Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings as in sacrifices, or in sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Samuel or Saul wanted to help God. He wanted to make some sacrifices. He wanted to bring certain things back when God told him to completely wipe out everything. And here he's told, you need to obey rather than sacrifice. God doesn't need my help and God doesn't need your help. God simply wants us to obey Him. Now, in the book of Samuel, there are three key figures. In 1 Samuel 1 through 7, we've got the life and the rule of Samuel. Then in chapters 8 through 31, we have Saul. Overlapping during that period in chapters 16 through 31, we also have some of the events and the rise of David as well. And so three key figures, Samuel, Saul, and David are in this great book of 1 Samuel. And of course, the lesson is we've got to be very careful what we ask for, we may get it, but it may not be what we really need. We must obey God and let Him be the King of our life. And if we desire to live a happy life, we've got to follow His will and follow His teaching. As you look at practical lessons, for 1 Samuel, one of the greatest, most powerful lessons in this book is what parents can do, something parents can do to help make their children servants of God. I love the example of, of Hannah here. Hannah is married to a man by the name of Elkanah. This man has two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. Hannah is barren. Her rival, Peninnah, she has children and thus she's always provoking or taunting Hannah because she doesn't have any children. And so Hannah goes up to the temple and she's praying to God to bless her with a child so that she can find that joy and that happiness that Peninnah and Elkanah have. Then I want you to notice what she says in 1 Samuel 1 verse 11. If God will just give her a child, look at her attitude. 1 Samuel 1 verse 11. The Bible says, Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, watch this, then 
I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. What can parents do to help their children be godly children? If we had the motto, motto and the attitude, if you'll just give me a child, I'm going to give him to you all the days of his life. How much good we can do for the cause of Christ. You know, we want our children to grow up and be well educated. We want our children to do good in sports and we push them in those areas. We want them to go to college and get a degree. Do we put the same effort forward in helping them to grow up and learn to serve God? Are we really willing to say to God, if you'll just bless us with children, we're going to do our best to give Him to you all the days of His life. You know, I think of people like, like Samson. Samson's parents, they t did what they could. They made him walk that line. They tried to help him live the right life. Now, Samson made some bad choices, but his parents followed through with their vow, and he should have been a good godly person but he ended up making bad choices and then there are others like John the Immerser Luke 1 verse 6 both of his parents were righteous before God walking in all the statutes and commandments of the Lord blameless there's a, a, a child who had a head start above others Mary and Joseph great godly parents the parents of Jesus and so we think about how to help our children be godly and there's no greater way than to make them, to help them realize you're here to serve God. Life is not about you. Life is about giving yourself to God. But then we can look at the flip side of that. What can parents do to send their children straight to hell? Well, you can look in 1 Samuel 2 and you can see an example in verses 12 and verse 17. Look at what Eli's sons are doing. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Here you've got sons of Belial, a, a horrible word describing their, their character, their horrendous character. They're taking the women uh, next to the temple and using them in an ungodly way. They're taking more of the meat than they ought to. They're not helping people to worship God. They're actually hindering the worship God, the worship of God and His service. Now, look what is said of them in chapter 2, verse 17. The scripture then comments, Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. They had a negative influence on people at the temple. They didn't even want to go up and worship because these men were so evil and ungodly, and Eli didn't put a stop to it. He spoke to them, but that's all he did. He should have done more to stop their sin and to make them do right. They're your children, you're responsible for them. And so parents have a great responsibility in raising up their children. The greatest thing you can do is bring up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Train up your child in the way he should go. Proverbs chapter 22 verses 7 through 15. Make sure that you're always putting the Word of God before their face, helping them to see it, just as in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9, it's on the doorpost, it's on the frontlets, it's everywhere so that children can see and learn and hopefully make good decisions in following God. Now, let's look at an example of a young man who is ready to serve. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, we now get an update on Hannah's son Samuel and look at his readiness to serve God. The context is this, Samuel has been lying down and he hears a voice cry out to him Samuel and so he runs to his master Eli you called me no I didn't call you go lay back down he hears that call again Samuel you called me master no I didn't call you and so this happens a couple of times and then Eli says I haven't called you but if you hear it again here's what you say and look at the words in 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 10 the Bible says, Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. What a great attitude Samuel here has. It reminds me of Isaiah. Isaiah hears that call go forth. Who shall we send? Who shall go forth for us? That echo goes from the temple of God. And Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. What a great attitude both Isaiah and Samuel had. Speak, Lord, your servant hears. 
how we need the attitude of Samuel in our readiness to hear and to do what God says. Are we really listening to the Word of God? You know, you hear the same refrain in every one of the seven letters in Revelation 2 and 3. To him that has ears to hear, let him hear. Have you ever really thought about that passage? You ever really thought about that statement? You know, you can see the irony of the Lord. How many people do you know that don't have ears? Well, that's the Lord's point. The Lord gave us ears, thus we must use them for the purpose we're given them, to hear, to listen, and to know what God wants us to do. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, take heed how you hear. Luke 8, 18, take heed what you hear. We need to make sure that we hear carefully and we're willing to do what God says. And so let's have that readiness of mind. I want to serve God. I'm ready to hear what He says. Speak, Lord. Your servant hears. And then I'm reminded of the sad address of Samuel to God in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Now here's what's happened. The people have come to Samuel and they said, You're old. Your sons don't walk in your way. We want you to give us a king just like all the nations around us. Well, that hurt Samuel a little bit but it hurt God more. I want you to look at the response of Samuel and God in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. The scripture says, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you. Notice, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. God was hurt. Samuel was hurt. Why? Because they had a king. Friend, we've got to realize today that God is still the Creator, that He's still the King in the universe, that His Son is head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that heaven has already settled the matter. Psalm 119, verse 89, God's Word is settled in heaven and that God is our King. And we must live like it. You know, if God's our king, that means he's the final authority. And I am amenable to him and to his law. So many people live this life as though there's no one in control, no authority, and we can just do whatever we want to do. Friends, such is not the case. If God is the author of mankind, and he is, he has absolute authority over me and over you. Isn't that what Jesus said? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus has all authority. On the last day, when we stand before God, it's the Word of God that will be our judge. John 12, 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. God's Word is the final authority. It has the last say, and thus we need to ask the question, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37 and verse 17 will be judged by how we've lived our life according to the Bible, and thus we need to be submissive and let God rule our lives. Now I want you to notice also Samuel's great address to the people of Israel and the encouragement and the hope that he offers them if they will only submit to the will of God. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses 14 through 16. The Bible here says, If you fear the Lord and serve Him and obey His voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Now therefore stand and see the great things which the Lord does will do before your eyes. You know, when you think about this address, Samuel knows the people are already getting rebellious. He knows their desire to have a king is so they can be like the nation. So he reminds them, you've got to obey God. If you want this to go right, you need to let God be in control and you need to obey Him. If I'm going to live a life that's pleasing to God, it is absolutely essential that I obey Him. Friend, we cannot stress enough 
our need to obey God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. The scripture says in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus speaking, not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there, but he who does the will of my Father. Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are those who keep his commandments. They may have right to the tree of life and they may enter therein. The idea of keeping God's law is clear throughout Scripture. The people who made the biggest mistakes and suffered the most were those who did not keep and did not obey the law of God. Now another powerful lesson we learn from 1 Samuel is that God does not work in numbers as we sometimes think. You know, David wanted to number the people of God and it wasn't against God's will. That was a sin. Sometimes we think, well, there's just not enough of us. If we just had more, we could do good. Or we're not big enough, we don't, we're not powerful enough. We need to realize that God is not limited by numbers like we are today. Look at the simple statement of 1 Samuel 14 verse 6. The scripture simply says, Then Jonathan said to the young man, young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. You know, you look back to Israel's history, such as times like the time of Gideon, just a few hundred men, God defeated them. God didn't need a massive army to defeat Israel's enemies. God plus one is always the majority. God works not in numbers, but with the faithful. If we'll remain faithful to God, we can always be pleasing unto Him. Now we want to notice as well the ultimate failure that the first king Saul made. Saul is anointed as king. He's a handsome, good-looking, tall, strong man but he doesn't have the qualities God's really looking for. His ultimate failure is he did not fully obey the will of God. In 1 Samuel 15, God tells Saul and the people, I want you to go in and I want you to completely wipe out these heathen nations. I don't want you to leave anything. Woman and child, ox, beast, you just wipe it all out. Well, Saul pretty much did that. In fact, he did about 99% of that except he brought back the king. He brought back some of the best of the livestock, some of the best of their stuff, so that he could offer that to God. Well, how did God feel about that? He was doing it for God. He was doing it to help God. How did God feel about that? Look at the words in 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. The Scripture says, So Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He also has rejected you from being king. It was only a small change. And He did about 99% of all God said. How did God feel about that? God said, you reject me, I'm rejecting you. It's like rebellion. It's like the sin of witchcraft. I didn't want your sacrifice, God said. I wanted obedience. I didn't need the fat of rams. I wanted you to listen to me. And thus, we are again impressed with our need to do exactly what God says in the Bible. You know, sometimes people say, well, this may not really be in the Bible, but we're going to do this to help God. You know, we're just going to spice up our music a little bit, bring in some drums, bring in some nice lights, bring in some other things, just to kind of bring it up to speed, and this will just help God. Friends, God doesn't need our help. When God said, sing and make melody in your heart, that's all God wanted. If we do something other than that, are we not in the same boat as Saul? where we needed to listen and not bring in our own ideas, not bring in things that we desire. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, it'd be great if we could just bring in a, a, maybe a female speaker for one Sunday. Maybe we could just bring in a woman and let her preach. That'd be something different. That'd be something nice. And it might make people feel better. Feel better about the church. Feel better about women's roles. No. 
That's not what God wants, and God clearly has spoken on that. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, Paul said, I do not permit a woman to speak or to be in authority over a man, but to be in silence. That's God's will on the matter. Well, maybe although Christmas is not really the birth of Jesus, maybe we ought to just have a, a Christmas service. Friends, the Bible has spoken. We're to remember the Lord's death every first day of the week. Christmas is not in the Bible. We ought not to be worshiping God in that way because God has not asked for us to do those things. It's contrary to the will of God. Well, someone says, well, maybe we could spice things up by having a drama and a play. Again, just like Saul, that's something God has not asked for, and that is disobedience to the will of God. God has said He chose the foolishness of preaching to save those who are lost. God didn't ask for a drama or a play, a ten-piece rock band. God has told us clearly what to do, and all this is all He wants. Listen carefully. All God wants for me to do and for you to do is to obey what He's already said in this book. He doesn't need my help and He doesn't need yours. God just wants us to submit and obey His will. And friends, it's that simple and that plain. We don't have to flare or spice things up for God. God told us how to do it. Let's obey the will of God. Now, what is it that God is looking for in an individual? Is it the outward appearance? Is it the hair? Is it the skin tone? Is it the body physique? What's God really looking for in an individual? Well, we learned that in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7. I want you to notice what God looks for in a person. The Bible says, But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Notice this. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God doesn't look at what we look at today. We look at someone and everything fits just right. We say that's a good looking person. Tall, slender, have the right skin tone, have the right physique. They're attracted to us in a physical sense. God doesn't look that way. God looks beyond the, the facade of our body, the, the shell that we're in, and He sees to the heart. And if our heart's what it ought to be, that's what's pleasing to God if it's not. God knows that as well. Do you remember in Matthew 23 what Jesus said to the Pharisees? Jesus said, you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful, ornate, highly decorated on the outside, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, Jesus said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's what comes out. By our words will be justified, and by our words will be condemned. They, we've got to be careful, therefore, of every idle word that we speak. Let's make sure that we put the emphasis where God puts the emphasis. Not here, but what's in here. Do we have a heart to follow God? That's what God is really looking for. And then we have that great passage, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 through 47 shows us that David, as a young man, was able to conquer the Goliath in his life. Here's the background. The people of God have been in battle against the heathen nations, and this heathen nation has a giant by the name of Goliath. And every morning he comes out and taunts the people of God. Is there not a man who can come up against me? They were taunted by this man for many days. And so David comes to bring supplies to the people. Looks too young to fight, can't even wear the armor. But he hears this man taunting the people of God. It enrages him with a righteous fury, and David decides, I'm going to, with God's help, defeat this man, I'm going to hush him, and the Philistines are going to be defeated by God. Now I want you to notice what the text says in 1 Samuel 17, beginning in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, 
with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth. Then all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know the Lord does not save a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Now you remember the rest of the story. David can't even wear the armor. armor. He can't pick up the sword necessarily and do battle with it, but he takes a sling and a few small stones, and with one of those stones he hurls it, and Goliath drops dead. God used David to defeat that great giant. And remember, it was the battle that belonged to the Lord. God was the one in control, and David was just the instrument God was using. Friend, there may be difficulties, there may be challenges, there may be Goliaths in our life. Here's the message for us. If we'll put our trust in God, and we'll have the faith to follow Him wherever He goes, if we'll have the faith to go to God and ask Him for help in time of need, God can help us defeat the enemies in our life. Have you defeated the greatest enemy of all? Satan himself. There's no greater enemy in my life and in yours than Satan. The Bible says he's like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. In the book of Job, he is seen as going to and fro, back and forth upon the earth, looking for souls to devour. Jesus said to Simon, 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 Satan desires to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And each of us can insert our name where Simon's is. Satan desires to have me, and he desires, to, he desires to have you, and he wants each of us to spend eternity with him in a devil's hell. But the good news is, you don't have to be lost. I don't have to be lost. I can overcome Satan. And the reason is, because Jesus overcame him. Hebrews 2 verse 14 says, He, Jesus, through death, overcame him who had the power of death and has therefore released those who all their lifetime were subject to death or bondage. Jesus has defeated the devil and so can we. And so what's the lesson? Let's let God lead our lives. Let's let Him be in control. Let's submit to His will. And if we will obey and faithfully follow the God of heaven, He will ultimately lead us toward that place we know of as heaven. May God help each of us to live a life of faithfulness to God and and enjoy that great reward. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wants. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.